Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the hashtag Sea Arthritis interview booth. It is my absolute honor um, and pleasure to be in the studio today with Dr. Hani El Gabalawi. Um, Dr. El Gabalawi and I have known each other for many years. Uh, we have talked as patient researcher colleagues, we have talked as patient to clinician, we have talked as friends, and uh, it's just an honor uh, to be with you today, um, Dr. Ogabalawi, and we thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about uh, you um, and where you're situated uh, presently, Dr. Ogabalawi. Um, for our audience, Dr. Al-Gabalawi is a clinical rheumatologist and researcher, uh, is a professor of medicine and, uh, and immunology at the University of Manitoba, where he also holds the endowed chair uh, in rheumatology, uh, research chair in rheumatology. Um, Dr. Al-Gabalawi is not one to toot his own horn, but I will. Uh, he, if we took the time to read his curriculum vitae, we would be here all day, literally, uh, in terms of everything that he studied and reported out on, which is a really important part of research. He's actually turned out facing to the public and talked about his research findings, which is critical. Um, but he's widely recognized for his contributions in the field of rheumatology and immunology with a specific focus on rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and Indigenous health. And um, we really, I could go on and on about Dr. Al-Gabalawi, but we're just going to dive in and, and start our chat. So welcome again, uh, Dr. Al-Gabalawi. So I guess first for our audience, uh, we always like to start at the beginning, which is please uh, tell our audience a little bit more about yourself that area of focus that I just mentioned uh, in, in clinical and, and rheumatology research um, and anything else you'd like to share with the audience. Great. Thanks for this opportunity, Cheryl. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be doing this. Um, so, so I started out in the, in the early 80s as an internal medicine resident at McGill University looking for an area of focus as uh, people at that stage do. And, and as always, it's mentorship, it's running into people who inspire you. And several people uh, at McGill at that time inspired me to do rheumatology, uh, not the least of which is, is Dr. John Esdale, who was then a, a, this uh, up and coming star, or a junior faculty, just uh, done some great work at Yale and came back and, uh, and, uh, and uh, he kind of uh, uh, inspired me of, uh, of uh, the, the rheumatology and, and the potential uh, uh, career that one could have in it. So I'm very grateful to him for that. Um, I, I, I went into uh, private practice for five years in Fredericton and my wife was from there and we had our started our family there three kids and uh, surrounded by family and friends and uh, and then i i, I moved to winnipeg in uh, in 1990 uh, to pursue a more academic career i wanted i wanted to do more more engaged in benchtop research and and it was really a, a basic scientist by the name of john wilkins who was the big draw for me he's a, a, an inspired basic scientist who who uh, uh, really complemented my interests. And so he had a clinician scientist and a basic scientist working together. And we really accomplished a lot together over the years, uh, uh, not without uh, frequent healthy disagreements, may I add, <laughs> as, as uh, clinicians and, and, and basic scientists often do. But that, you know, that's, that's the, the strength of those kind of relationships. Um, he's retired now after establishing a, a wonderful uh, center for proteomics and systems biology here at the University of Manitoba, and, and I, I remain a, uh, one of the principal investigators here, and have incorporated uh, new blood, so to speak, uh, people like uh, Dr. Liam O'Neill, who's a rising star in the, in the rheumatology world as a clinician scientist. So and it's good to know that uh, that uh, that others will be able to follow you, uh, uh, in 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 a path that you think is the right path, and and that uh, things just don't vanish uh, when you vanish off the face of this earth, so to speak. So yeah, you know, it's so not that's something my that the lay public thinks about is this succession planning in research, and it is it's so critical, like it is in other aspects of our life. Otherwise, there is. 
you know, kind of like a cliff. Uh, so we de definitely don't want to see that happen to your incredible body of work. Um, and I know you will remain very active no matter what it is uh, you do. I'm intrigued by the microscope that's sitting back uh, behind you there. Uh, I, I gather that's not something you use at the moment. It's something that collects more dust than it does examine something. It is very true. Dish. Yeah. But, but I have it there to remind me of where I came from. Yeah. And where I came from is that was the first piece of capital equipment that the University of Manitoba bought for me. When I arrived here, so I can, uh, you know, my interests were in looking at inflamed joint tissue. And uh, you know, we published quite a bit of very good work using that microscope. Uh, and uh, so it, it's been replaced these days by more uh, uh, sophisticated technology. But still, it's it's my piece of technology and uh, and I'm very attached to it. I love it. And, and when we as a lay public think of basic science, the strong image that still comes up in my mind is a microscope. So thank you for keeping me contemporary uh, <laughs> with your desktop. Um, I wanted to talk to you, Dr. Agabalawi, about um, the lecture that you just gave at the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association annual scientific meeting. Um, you, you, uh, you led a workshop, but you also gave uh, a lecture that is really the keynote, uh, one of the keynote talks at, at the meeting every year, the Dunlop Doddridge Lecture. Um, so first, congratulations on that incredible honor. So let's first start, though, with the workshop. Yeah. Um, tell us, give us sort of the Coles notes, if you will, um, from the workshop in terms of the approaches to rheumatoid arthritis prediction and prevention. So something that's going to be really of interest to our audience. Yep. Um, as you know, arthritis consumer experts, a large number of our members across uh, the country live with a type of autoimmune arthritis, if not rheumatoid arthritis, then one of its kissing cousins, so to speak. So um, you're going to tell us, I think, a little bit about what can be done in terms of prediction and prevention at the individual level, at the community level, and, and at the national level. So give our audience a little peek into what uh, you talked about at your workshop. Yeah, I think I think that uh, uh, many of uh, of your uh, of the folks in your audience would be aware that we now have uh, through probably a couple of decades worth of knowledge recognize that rheumatoid arthritis starts long before the joints get sore, the joints get inflamed, the immune system starts to uh, deviate from normal up to seven, ten, maybe even longer, fifteen years before things start. And we've learned ways of uh, detecting that. Uh, the, 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 um, the most readily available being testing for the rheumatoid arthritis autoantibodies in the blood and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and finding individuals who would be at increased risk based on having those, uh, those antibodies in the blood. Um, and just fast forwarding a little bit here, we also know that uh, the people that have the autoantibodies in their blood, a substantial proportion of them never go on to develop rheumatoid arthritis. The, in fact, the autoantibodies come and go. But we also know that it, 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 somebody who has autoantibodies is clearly at higher risk of developing the disease down the road. So um, in this day and age, we, the, these are readily detected in every laboratory, in a, a clinical laboratory. You send a sample in, they, they test it. And so one of the ideas that we're pursuing is that can we screen large populations uh, for the presence of these autoantibodies and, uh, and then based on that, follow these individuals more carefully and, uh, and, and try to understand a little bit more uh, about how the disease starts. And that's, that's what we did in, for the last uh, 15, 20 years uh, uh, through generous funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and other funding agencies. But now we have gotten ourselves into a situation where we're starting to ask the question, well, well, gee, if we can detect this, uh, what are we going to do by telling people other than just yeah. worrying them, right? And, and so we, we're really moving into an era where we're thinking, okay, is there an opportunity to do something at a stage before the disease actually manifests itself as joint inflammation uh, that would uh, would achieve something that would be not achievable later on, uh, which is to prevent the disease from starting. So that's the premise we're working on. And uh, there's been some 
considerable activity internationally, uh, mostly on individuals who are very close to their disease starting and that they have the, the autoantibodies, but they also have symptoms, uh, stiffness in the morning, pain in the joints. The joints aren't necessarily swollen, uh, so you can't say they have rheumatoid arthritis. They don't meet the, our current criteria, but we know they're very close. And, and, and uh, several prevention studies have been done uh, uh, in, in this, particularly in Europe. And so far, uh, what's really been shown is that these have delayed the onset rather than prevented. So we, we are wondering whether if you go further back and you detect these antibodies before people have any symptoms, knowing that it's not a perfect tool, uh, can we uh, actually do achieve more by treating with something further back? So we've, we've, we appro approach this in two ways. One is the screening of the populations. Two is, okay, once we've screened, what are we going to give people? So in terms of screening, we have developed a finger stick method where you, uh, where you, you know, using a, you know, very familiar technology that you test for glucose levels and things like that. You got to drop a blood on a piece of blotting paper, and then it comes to our lab. We extract the protein from it and test it for the presence of the antibodies. Easy to do, can be done in the home, put in an envelope, sent. So this is the kind of thing we think is scalable to use in, um, in First Nations community, remote First Nations communities, in multiple communities, both urban and rural and so on. So one of the things we did in the workshop was talked about uh, the strengths and weaknesses of this dry blood spot technology applied to this particular uh, 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 application. And we, have, we, we were really privileged to have world experts like uh, Mar Fritzler and uh, uh, Lee Eder and Joan Wither and people like that who are really, you know, leaders and Canadian leaders and who are, you know, commented on, on our approach, uh, uh, what, you know, what are the pitfalls of using this type of approach? So that, that workshop was very valuable from that point of view. The second, which is, okay, so we've identified people who are who are positive using this approach or, or, or traditional approaches. And pre-symptomatic, pre-symptomatic. Pre-symptomatic. Yeah, exactly. okay. Um, what are we going to do with that? So yeah. we, we, we undertook uh, some animal experiments, mouse experiments, a number of years ago. We were inspired by some epidemiologic studies suggesting that nutritional supplements of vitamin D and omega-3 uh, in, a, in quite a large U.S. epidemiological study to prevent cancer and heart disease. It didn't do very well in that, but in the secondary analysis, there was a suggestion that maybe the incidence of rheumatoid arthritis was lowered by this, especially taking the two together. So uh, we, we also looked at literature that curcumin, which is the, act, the, the, the active ingredient in turmeric, also had some very potent biological effects and anti-inflammatory effects. So we took all three of them, gave them to mice that in a mouse model of inflammatory arthritis before it started. And we used them individually and in combination, showed that we could largely prevent the arthritis from starting in the mice using these supplements. So we thought, okay, this might be, these are, have acceptable uh, uh, toxicity, you know, these are available on shelves and so on. So um, maybe if we use them early enough, they would do something that would deviate the immune response back to normal and prevent the onset. So that's what we're pursuing right now. So um, uh, that's the second thing we discussed in the workshop is the use of this, uh, a clinical trial of this nature, take these supplements. We've already done this in 50 healthcare workers, given them the supplements, shown that it's safe. You know, they don't have, uh, you know, they had all yeah. the expected. Yeah. Uh, and, and and so, if, so if, if, we, if we did that in people who have the autoantibodies, uh, can we do something? The problem is our studies with families of, of, of uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients showed that we have to wait an average of five years before the disease started from them coming into the study. You can't power a study uh, with that. So we have to come up with surrogate uh, uh, markers in the blood to tell us we're doing something. And that was the focus of the discussion in the workshop. Yeah. Well, what, what can we use to tell us we're doing something as opposed to just waiting for arthritis to happen? And the third thing we discussed in the workshop was the ethics of treating people uh, uh, with things like, you know, that model's well established with lipid lowering agents like statins with 
hypertension, but it's not well established in the autoimmune. No, and the and the and what we're using is significantly different as yep. as well. Yeah, yep. and and awesome. the potential for toxicity or adverse event, maybe while not great, you still have to balance, you know. Yep the the unknown really yeah and, and and really i think the 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 challenge is knowing that you have you're gonna be over treating a lot of people because as i mentioned those antibodies come and go or they go away so you have to do something that's reasonably safe because you can so you can afford to over treat a whole bunch of people to get that small fraction of people who would otherwise have developed rheumatoid arthritis you may be able to change that trajectory would that same proposition, though, be true in other chronic diseases, Dr. Agavalawi? Like, would other disease communities, in other words, need to make that same pro-con choice when talking about so. prevention? Very much so. Very yeah. much so. It's the same, it's the same conundrum with, with chronic disease of various... And I think the advantage here, as I mentioned at the start, is that we do have these, these antibodies in the blood that becomes a very important indicator of risk right. for us. Uh, just for instance, as uh, high cholesterol levels uh, are for uh, cardiovascular disease and, and so on. So you know, high cholesterol levels don't do anything to you. You don't feel them or anything, but they become a very good biomarker to tell you that individual is at increased risk of developing a heart attack or a stroke. So it's similar arguments with chronic other chronic diseases. Yeah. Unbelievably fascinating. I think this approach uh, using nutraceuticals is obviously really popular already in, in people like me. I have rheumatoid arthritis. I use a variety of supplements already. Um, so when you think about prevention and you think about possibly using things that are over the counter, you're just basically looking at interaction with other things you may currently be taking or are those things pure enough? You you would need to know that the source is good, yeah. right? Yeah, so you'd yeah. have some of those consumer type questions. Yeah. But otherwise, you're saying the downside is the length of time it takes. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. that's right. You just you just you know I mean we have uh, we've shown as I mentioned the animal model that there's something specific about that combination. And each of them, the, there's lots of literature out there about the benefits of vitamin D. In, in, and yeah. and we, we did some studies showing that in the winter, uh, in our population, the First Nations population and the rest of the Canadian population, vitamin D levels are quite low yeah. because we just don't get the sunshine and so on. So this is particularly important in the winter. The omega-3 story has been around a long time, fish oil, anti-inflammatory, and the curcumin story has been around in other cultures for centuries, uh, and uh, you know, used in in cooking and so on. One of the one of the challenges of curcumin and turmeric is that it's absorbed poorly. So we've worked with formulations that improve the absorption of it, so that it actually gets some of it. But you know, these are technical things. But we believe that that combination has good potential for doing what we think it might do. Yeah. It's incredibly fascinating. I know that our audience is gonna uh, is gonna email us with a lot of other questions, uh, which we'll do our best to answer. But some that we may not be able to, we'll possibly uh, try to tickle you into to providing us answers. I want to sort of focus on a population that you've referred to often in 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 the in the workshop, and that's first First Nations. And I know you've done a lot of work on rheumatoid arthritis and the impact of it on First Nations people, uh, particularly in Manitoba. Um, and I wanna ask you, you know, as we are uh, walking the path uh, forward towards truth and reconciliation, and we look to build uh, trusting, culturally appropriate, um, supportive relationships with our First Nations brothers and sisters, you know, I want to ask you, how do you see us uh, being able to work with communities who are First Nations to detect and prevent diseases like rheumatoid arthritis? How do we bring together um, two distinctly different types of societies? I mean, our First Nations people are indigenous um, to this land. Uh, colonial settler viewpoints on medicine are different, to be sure, than than our indigenous communities. 
how how do we work through the puzzle, Dr. Yeah. Ogabalawi? I know you've spent years doing this work, um, and I know your interest as well as our organizational interest is in working in meaningful, trust, trusting, culturally appropriate relationships. Tell us about your work and what you've learned and what you hope hope to see moving forward. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to yeah. comment on this. It's, 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 a, it's a, obviously a very important point for me and, 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 and for the general context that you mentioned there. Yeah. So the first of all is, is you have to make sure that what you're studying, the, the questions you're studying are relevant and, and, and impactful for not just you and your scientific community, but for the people who are going to be studied. Yeah. So, so it has to be a common agenda that is recognized uh, as as compelling questions. And and uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, through our work and the work of others, is is particularly devastating in First Nations people. Yeah. And not all First Nations people, but certainly uh, First Nations uh, uh, populations in the plains of Canada and the United States. Uh, in the in the circumpolar areas, for instance, the Inui and the Haida, and they have you, rheumatoid arthritis rates that are comparable to any other population in the world. In the, in the plains and the population we study, the Cree, the Ojibwe, the Oji Cree, in the U.S. in the Pima, in the Chippewa, in the Yakima, in, the, in, in, in multiple populations, the, the 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 rates of rheumatoid arthritis are three to five times higher than yeah. any other population in the world. So that's number one. Number two, it's bad disease. And, and we've shown, why is it bad disease? It's disabling disease. More often than not, it involves disabling joints like the knees, the hips, the shoulders, the elbows. So the levels of disability go. The outcomes are terrible. And we just published a paper with uh, Carol Hitchin last year showing that on average, a new a person with new rheumatoid arthritis whose First Nations dies 20 years younger than a person with rheumatoid arthritis who's non-First Nations. Right. So, yeah, no, that's that's obviously a very complex picture of, of you know, access to care and biology and sociology and so on. Concomitant that, diseases. Concomitant yeah. disease. But that's yeah. the reality. So yeah. it's a compelling problem. And I think that, so that's number one is that the communities have to be uh, aware that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. And I think we've done a pretty good job at that. And we've done that through, uh, when we go to communities, you gotta show up to the community and, uh, and, and be there and be visible, but most importantly, be heard. And we've worked with the local radio stations uh, as, as, an, as a very, very effective way of getting our message across. We have radio call-in shows where people say, hey, you know, I, what about the weather? You know, all the questions that you expect. But people get engaged with that, and the level of knowledge of the community uh, goes up. So that's yeah. number, number and, and so does trust, which is a really so important part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So other things, working with uh, uh, the local uh, uh, health leaders there, the health directors, uh, working with uh, lo working with local research assistants who can help uh, uh, you know who are connected to this both the study and to the community to help uh, with the conduct of the study and uh, and most importantly is having community consent we, we we're used to thinking about consent to do clinical research but here's a consent form you make sure that people understand and so on when you're working with first nations people you don't only need an individual consent but you need community consent. Yeah. And that's it. that's in the form of research agreements, which are worked out on a principle called OCAP, which ownership, control, access, possession, uh, which, you know, kind of comments on things like what you can do with samples, what you can do with secondary use of data, secondary use of samples, and so on. All of these have to be incorporated into research agreements. And most importantly, it's not a one agreement fits all. Yeah, we have worked with several communities and undertook the study in several communities, and each community is unique, and has individual uh, needs and uh, and cultural uh, uh, um, environments, and those each agreement has to be unique to that community. So we have a community an agreement with each community, and each of them has a bit of a different flavor, but all of them have some commonalities 
around the principles of OCAP and what you can and can't do. So, yeah. so, so those, those are the general principles and you gotta, you gotta show up and you gotta keep showing. And as you do in life, yeah. as you do in life, you know, it, it strikes me as I listen to you, Dr. al that language is so important and language is the way through, you know, through spoken word that we inter interact and I know when I first uh, came into arthritis research as a lay person, you know, there was a huge ramp up uh, educational process. I had to try to figure out how to decode your language. And, and, and it wasn't something that was done easily. And I think our education community, our lay community that is trying to work with indigenous peoples uh, across the land and you as expert researchers uh, are, are walking forward to learn a new language, to deeply understand the cultural impact of racism, um, of, of um, you know, Indian residential schools, intergenerational trauma. These, this is the setting of health for indigenous peoples. Yeah. And, and I'm, really encouraged when I hear you talk about the deep levels of consultation that you've undertaken. And, and I know how time consuming that is, but it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. And, yeah, no, and it's a model I think that can be used across the country in terms of rheumatology research, because we have underserved indigenous populations in every province, in every territory, uh, the picture you painted of health in your own province for um, First Nations uh, that you work with directly is also and also Inuit. It's it those are truisms across the country. The outcomes are worse. The the incidence and prevalence is much higher. It's it's horrible. Yeah, and and I and I have to, you know, I have to take this opportunity to 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 put to, you know to promote a theme that you and I and are uh, when we're in, in 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 the museum for human rights uh, that that really uh, struck me which is the role of young people yeah you know the, how disadvantaged they were through the residential school uh, uh, system and so on but you know uh, uh, that quote that I saw at the at the museum of human rights is. Uh, 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 the young do not know enough to be prudent, so they attempt the impossible and they achieve a generation after generation. We have to capture the young people. Uh, we have to capture First Nations young people. Yeah. Uh, and so we take great pride in having some of the best First Nations students uh, engaged in our program and, uh, and uh, actively promoting their involvement in the research, their involvement with their communities, because you know, I mean, this 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 is true uh, uh, reconciliation is to, yeah. is to build the next generation. Yeah, and these relationships have to be founded on equity, respect, humility, love, all of those things. I know you've brought to your work for for years, and um, I just I just you know you've been a role model for a lot of people in your community, Dr. Gabalawi. Thank you for that. Um, and I look forward to seeing the continuation of this research program um, that you've started with specifically First Nations people in Manitoba. And I hope uh, to be involved with you in other in other uh, relationships with um, Indigenous peoples that are going to ask questions, uh, maybe even in a different way uh, than than we've asked in in the past. Um, I want no, to maybe just, probably probably or let's just say <laughs> for sure we're yeah. going to show up as you say yeah. um you know this year's meeting I want to just sort of focus a little bit on the theme of this year's Canadian uh, Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association's uh scientific meeting and it was about the theme of the meeting's confluence and collaboration um and and really focusing on shared decision making You've been in your profession, in your medical profession, in your research career around for, for a long time. How have you seen, how has shared decision-making benefited you, your work, your patients, your research partners, and how have you seen it change over the years? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah. And, and so, so the first 
you know, it, when, when I was first training, there was this, uh, and, and certainly the generation before mine, there was this uh, aura that physicians had, which is, you know, you go in and you tell the patient what to do. Yeah. Because, you know, you because of this kind of uh, oh, paternalistic, I know what's good for you, is it, you know. And then over the decades that, that that you and I have been around and engaged in healthcare and healthcare delivery, I think there's been a clear shift to where people uh, have become a, a, a much more aware that they're dealing with gray zone, that physicians are dealing with gray zone, and uh, and that this decision making has to be based on trust, but it has to be based on a recognition that uh, uh, no solution is perfect. Yeah. And you have to accept the fact that this is the best solution under this circumstances and and perhaps with wider consultation with with a multi, you know not just uh, the medical profession but but other sources of consultation you would kind of weigh them together. So in this day and age when when you when you're sitting down and talking to a patient you're saying okay here are your choices uh, and, and we're very fortunate that science has brought us along so we have choices yeah especially in rheumatoid arthritis when when you know so so when you're sitting down telling them the risks of this intervention versus the risks of that i think we're all comfortable with that part of the shared decision making i already alluded to the, to the fact that if you're working with in clinical research with first nations communities in particular there's not just in, in individual uh, risk to benefit discussions, but there's the whole community. Community wide, yeah. Community wide, you know, uh, approval and consent of, of undertaking this. There's another level of decision making, which is basically your interaction with your host organization and, <clears throat> and your host uh, healthcare, your hospital or your academic center. And, and, and there's shared decision making there as to what's possible. What are you allowed to do? What should you do? Uh, was there funding to do? How is this impacting on the resources that are otherwise going to be spent on this, that, or, or that, the other? So at all levels, there is shared decision making on the individual level, on a community level, and certainly on an institutional level. Yeah, you know, as a patient myself, I, I often forget about that. I often forget. And, and then who's going to pay for it? Yeah. But where, how does it get paid for is also in the backdrop constantly. It's it's actually at every level of shared decision making is how you power what can be made available or not financially. Um, you've been a great proponent, um, Dr. Gabalawi, about patient involvement in research. And I know that extends to your own rheumatology clinic. Um, and I know when I was first diagnosed almost 35 years ago, I wasn't asked, you know, well, what is it you want to try to accomplish with your treatment plan? <laughs> But now that should be a leading question in the yeah. patient clinician conversation is, well, Cheryl, what are you hoping to do? Like, what do you want to get out of this? Um, because we do have options now. When I was diagnosed, we had three options and, and yeah. none of them worked very well. Now we have, you know, many options. And for some patients, they can work. And if they're initiated early enough, they can make it such that your life isn't even impacted by the disease. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so I, I just, uh, I love how you describe the different levels of shared, of shared decision-making that they happen in every aspect of medicine, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, it's not a situation where, uh, you know, you and I will sit down and, oh, this is the best thing to do. And then you do it because yeah. we know the constraints that we live in, in, yeah. you know, both, you know, financial constraints and, and operational constraints, logistical constraints. So, so it, 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 I think you're right on uh, by 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 identifying decision making as at multiple levels uh, that kind of uh, we have to navigate through. Is there a way to optimize shared decision making in your view? I mean, apart from what you've just mentioned, like understanding is key to optimizing. Yeah. Um, so but you on, know, on are there some? Is there a secret sauce in your mind? No, there isn't a secret sauce, but there is. A, 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 so, for, for on an individual level, first of all, there is a, um, th there is ways of discussing risk 
with individuals so that they have truly have informed decision making. And, and uh, there was actually a, a very nice uh, recent uh, publication from Jeff Sparks in, in their rheumatology literature, mm -hmm. just quoting uh, uh, the dialogue between the physician and uh, the patient they're treating, the way you present risk. Uh, so let's say you're starting a biologic or a JAK inhibitor, something like that, and you say, well, there's a risk of cancer with this. How you describe that risk in a, in a, in a, in a, in a coherent way, while at the same time, presenting the information factually makes a very big difference. So that yeah. so that's a key is the communication on the one to one communication in in, um, in 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 shared decision with the community when you want the community to undertake a whole new approach to something or in, in our case the, the whole prevention RA prevention agenda you have to be honest you you know you 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 have to have set realistic expectations you know we're not going to we're not going to prevent uh, rheumatoid arthritis in next year. Yeah. And you got, you're working with us. So this is what we're trying to achieve short term and so on. And, uh, and then, and then, and then at the level of the institutional level, well, I don't have to tell you the kind of haggling that has to happen uh, to make, to make that happen. So uh, anyway. Yeah. Uh, I think, um, I think shared decision-making too, it's an N of one with your doctor, with your physician, yeah. every there, you can't just say, this is this shared decision-making formula that will lead to success. It varies by institution. If it's an institutional level discussion, it varies by research program in your team. And it certainly varies patient to physician um, because my, I'm an N of one, my journey with my disease is going to look very different perhaps than someone else, not because of the disease, but because of my life context. Um, and I think good clinicians under, understand that you're certainly, you've certainly led the way in that understanding. So thank you on behalf of all of us out there, even when you're not all of our physicians, you've led the way in that thinking, I think, to the many that you've trained over the years. Um, I want to end our discussion, Dr. Al-Gabalawi, with um, just ending on some of your thoughts around the patient's journey, the patient's journey with disease. I, I, I'm not a big fan of the word patient because it actually, by definition, means pa uh, passive recipient of care. And you know me well, I'm not passive about anything, so it doesn't describe me. I'm a person who happens to live with rheumatoid arthritis. That's how I think about myself in my own life. Um, and that gives me power, I feel. Um, so when you look at it, though, through your lens as a, as a physician, you're someone who has sworn a, an oath uh, to provide, you know, many different things in terms of the care that you deliver. But when you think about how to improve a patient's disease, uh, their self-care practices, their own self-advocacy journey, um, what what have you seen? What have you seen? Tell us your big pearl or your big kind of crescendo. Yeah. Well, what I've seen is is the emergence of Dr. Google. You know, I think, yeah, this, this has been the single most important thing relevant to this point that you're making is that, is that uh, patients, particularly patients with chronic diseases are consulting multiple different sources of information that are available at their fingertips. And, and, uh, uh, Effective clinicians recognize that, and uh, and you know without without being in any way punitive or or uh, uh, revulsed by the fact that oh you know so and so is coming in with an opinion that is you know recognizing that there are strengths and weaknesses to every bit of information that you get from anyone. So the individual will go out and get information from their physicians, from uh, 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 their relatives, from uh, online sources, for credible and not so credible. And ultimately, uh, the, the challenge for an individual with, with a chronic disease is to understand the strengths and limitations of each of those sources. Which is health literacy, which is health yeah. literacy. Which is yeah. health literacy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then, 
because exactly as you've identified that each individual's journey is unique uh i i i've i've, I've come to really recognize the importance of compromise is that is that the, the pursuit of perfection is uh, is destined to failure you know in this world you just you know especially with with chronic diseases that are that are very, so you have to ultimately compromise and say okay with with a whole set of uh, opinions about what what I should do here there and 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 how I should run my life and how I should treat myself these are the compromises that I need to make to achieve the best outcome possible for myself right now yeah and 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 only only an individual can do that they have to be as you we start out this discussion and say you got to be true to yourself and 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 ultimately being true to yourself is recognizing that all of life is these compromises. And if you and if your lot in life is you have a chronic disease for which there's a lot of things to do, for which there's a lot of people who feel differently about what the right thing to do is, you have to learn the health literacy part, part of it, learn how to navigate this and accept the compromises and do what's best in any one particular day, in any one particular circumstance. That's yeah. that's my my words of wisdom and I, and I and I know that uh, uh, you know I I, I don't want to start quoting quotes, but I, I'm I love the quote from the Canadian icon uh, uh, Leonard Cohen: "Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in." Wow. Well, from a from a antique microscope to the words of Leonard Cohen, I'd say we've gone uh, from bench to bedside and back. Uh, Dr. Al Gabalawi, I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us um, in the hashtag C Arthritis uh, event. Um, I know this will be a much watched episode. We're going to offer some links at the end to some of those papers that you spoke about, uh, hopefully, lay versions uh, of them. Um, if they're an open access uh, journal uh, article, then you know folks will have uh, uh, it available to them. Otherwise, we'll try to do some. Uh, knowledge translation uh, on on our own for them. So um, just know that we'll try to link to some of those things that you've talked about in some of your important research work. But I, I want to thank you again for taking the time to talk to us, not just about um, your life's work, really, um, but to talk to us in such a meaningful way about how you deal with your own patients. Um, because you're not only helping people like me understand, you know, the clinical view, we think you're also helping your colleagues in rheumatology understand how you've been successful uh, at rheumatology practice yourself. So we really appreciate that. Thank you. And, and uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Cheryl. I mean, well, we've done this for decades. So we, we are, uh, we are part of a mutual fan club to be sure. So um, thank best. you so much, Dr. Ogabalawi. I hope we see each other soon. You, you bet. Thank Take you. Take care, everyone.